Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Berman, and I'm the CEO of the American Society of the University of Haifa. Thank you all for joining us today for our panel discussion, talking about advocating for the needs of marginalized communities in the time of COVID-19. Today, I'm very fortunate to have experts from University of Haifa's Clinics for Law and Social Change. The legal clinics at the university supplement and enrich the academic experience of legal scholars and advocate for the civil liberties and social justice of citizens throughout Israel, particularly those in our most vulnerable communities. We are very proud to be the home of eight independent and diverse clinics, each of which is reflective of the community and causes that it serves. Individuals living with disabilities, refugees in the Palestinian minority, issues surrounding technology and cyber law, and civil litigation are just a few examples of our areas of focus. Before we start today, I'd like to introduce you to our panel, along with our moderator, longtime ASUH friend and supporter, Stuart Rossman. So I don't know about the order on your screen, but um, first of all, uh, Ray Cohen is our Director of Civil Litigation and Legal Clinic. Tammy Harel ben Shahar is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law at University of Haifa and the Academic Director of our Legal Clinics. Dalit Ken Dorfeldman is the Legal Supervisor of Law, Technology, and Cyber Legal Clinic. And I'm going to now turn it over to Stuart Rossman, who is also the Director of Litigation at the National Consumer Law Center here in the United States. Thank you all very much. And as Stuart will tell you, if you have any um, questions for our panel, which we'll be taking at the end, you can submit them in the chat function or you can send them to um, info at asuh.org. Karen, you took the words right out of my mouth. So thank you very much. We certainly wanna make this as an interactive a discussion as, as possible. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be here with our panelists in particular. Uh, I had both the privilege and the pleasure uh, of spending two days on the campus at uh, Haifa University in uh, February uh, before the uh, quarantines went into effect uh, and had an extraordinary experience uh, working with the clinicians and visiting the clinics during that time. Uh, a great deal has obviously changed since then and, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the challenges and the successes of the clinics uh, have had dealing with the, uh, with the crisis uh, that we are all facing but is specific uh, to both the academic set, uh, setting and also trying to provide access to justice to disadvantaged communities as well. Uh, but I really have to uh, start off by, by asking first and foremost, how are you guys doing? Uh, it seems extraordinary that you're, you're adapting to uh, unexpected and uh, unfathomable uh, new challenges as well. But I'm concerned about how the clinicians are doing and how the students are doing and, and what are you doing to uh, uh, make this all work uh, when you're needed so much. So, Ray, just uh, starting for you, how are you doing? I got to spend some time at your clinic at, uh, in Hadar, which is now shut down. So what are you doing instead and how are you making it virtually work? Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, first, I'm uh, really glad um, we got this opportunity to talk uh, about uh, our work and, and I wanna thank the organizers uh, for, uh, for producing this uh, seminar, webinar. Um, so uh, still a question at the beginning, uh, me personally, I was in shock and very confused, I must admit. Um, I mean, now everything seems uh, so normal, um, the way uh, we teach, the way we work. Um, but at first, it, it really felt like uh, the end of the world is coming. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and I assume the students uh, felt the same um, as me. So. Uh, you know, we moved to online classes and in the first online class, uh, we just mainly talked about our feelings, um, you know, I asked them about uh, the hardships uh, they're having. I, I just wanted to, to offer them first um, a safe space and, and allow them to, uh, to ventilate because, um, you know, law students tend to be more stressed than other, even, uh, even in normal days. Um, and as far for uh, as our service, um, so at first I thought that maybe during the shutdown, uh, everything would come down uh, a little bit and uh, we'll have more time to invest in long-term projects. But uh, soon I realized that I was completely wrong because uh, our, workload, uh, our workload has doubled and, and we just had to, to keep with the pace of all the fast changes um, in the law. Uh, I think uh, for uh, my clinic personally, the luck uh, uh, was that it happened during the second semester and we already uh, did most of the, the training during 
the first semester. So instead of our, uh, so for example, instead of our um, uh, right center in Hadar, um, we, we had to move to, to a hotline based uh, service or uh, getting uh, referrals from organization we already uh, worked with. Um, so yeah, it was, it was strange at first, but I must admit uh, we adjusted really quickly uh, and now just really feels like a normal way to work. So Dalit, you, you head up the uh, law technology and cyber clinic. Is it fair to say this is your time? Uh, I think clearly we're, we're all relying upon technology in ways that uh, we never anticipated beforehand. Um, what, what has it meant for your clinic and how are you been handling uh, the, the change? First of all, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for the organizers to have this webinar. Um, you're correct, it's a uh, lot of technology and cyber clinic. We are used to technology and we are using it all the time. So some of the, our meetings, even before the COVID-19, uh, were handled also by Google Hangouts, uh, Skype, WhatsApp, or even using a plain telephone. So for us, the change was with technology was not that big a deal. However, we had to get used to the Zoom technology which was a new technology that we didn't use before. And we decided to write uh, guidelines also for the using uh, Zoom on smartphones as a service to the whole community. Uh, those guidelines were a big uh, hit because uh, they were translated also into Arabic, uh, English, Amharic and uh, Russian by volunteers. In addition, uh, one of my students uh, had to be quarantined um, as he returned from abroad uh, while helping his family in the business. Uh, he took all the flights instead of uh, his parents because of their age. Another student was panicking about the COVID-19, so I tried to let uh, all the students talk uh, about their fears, difficulties, uh, hopes, and everything they wanted to just, uh, to just talk about during our online sessions. And I personally had to get used to the idea that I have to be at home with my kids in the morning and to work at night. So I hope that I'll soon be able to catch up all my sleeping hours, but uh, hopefully everybody will. So Tammy, uh, you, you are the, uh, the uh, academic director for the clinics and you're sort of uh, at a different level. You're not directly dealing as much with students. So I have really two questions for you. Uh, first of all, how is your staff, how are the clinicians holding up under, under the strain here? But also, I, you know, there is this wonderful range of, of clinics. You might want to talk about some of the other clinics that are not represented today, uh, but they've been affected different ways because they have different needs and different uh, concerns as well. Yeah, thank you. I'll just join uh, in thanking um, uh, for this opportunity to talk about the clinics. I'm always uh, very excited to share uh, the work we do. Um, so I think, well, first we must say that we have been very lucky. I, I think the community, the, uh, the whole of the university community um, has been very lucky. We haven't had any casualties from our community. Um, and so, you know, the difficulties and the challenges are of course great and you know if you would have told me three months ago that this is where we would be i would you know it, it was un, un, unfathomable uh but still uh, i think these are relatively small challenges and we feel very blessed to be in this situation uh that said we had to do a lot of uh changes and uh, uh and to adjust very very quickly to the new situation and and as you said uh, my main focus was on the staff uh to see where they they were at uh, and to, to try and, and decide which of the activities we would be able to continue as, as they were and which, which activities would be, uh, uh, we, we would be able to, to move online. And I agree with what Ruth said, that we thought that we would not be able to do as much, as, uh, as much work uh, with clients and maybe think about sort of policy change projects, which is something that we do uh, always, but we also have a lot of work with clients. Uh, but what we saw was that the field was actually really, really in need uh, of legal aid in a lot of uh, different areas, labor law, even family law, problems of uh, domestic violence that uh, were aggravated due to uh, uh, to the lockdown. 
um, a lot of problems with poverty law, which Reut will talk about, uh, cases of education. So we have actually have an, had an upsurge in specific clients that we've had uh, to deal with. Um, so there, there has been a lot of uh, new, uh, new challenges and new projects that we are very busy with. Um, and we'll probably say more about that. Well, two follow-up questions on it. I, I assume, not knowing the demographics of our audience, just give a very quick 30-second uh, elevator speech uh, about what the function is of the clinical programs within the university and particularly within the law school. And then just as a slight follow-up question, I know that there are certain clinics that uh, it's great that Reuts and, and Belit's clinics are able to move forward, but not all of the clinics are in the same position and you've had to shut down some of your activities as well. Maybe just to talk about those. Great, so 30 second uh, clinic, what do we do, <laughs> is, is this. The clinics have three main, uh, main aims. It's basically there are courses in, uh, in uh, advanced courses in law. Uh, they aim to A, uh, give students an educational experience of what law really is about, uh, dealing with real cases with lawyers such as Reut and Dalit uh, that have real clients and real cases and the students join them in, in uh, um, in taking care of these cases, drafting uh, briefs, uh, going to court, drafting legislation, doing all these uh, legal, uh, all of this legal work. Uh, the second aim is to create positive social change, to uh, create access to justice for uh, marginalized communities and communities that don't have access to justice, and to promote human rights. So all of our eight clinics have different areas of activity and different areas of law, but all of them uh, aim to promote human rights rights in their in their field and the third uh, aim which i'll say a bit less about because it's uh, uh kind of less interesting for the for, for the ac real activity is to be a kind of uh, a, a place in which uh, in which scientific uh, in, uh, knowledge is created knowledge about the law and about um, about how uh, minorities have access to law power relations in law the difference between law and books and law and action uh, so a lot of the knowledge that is created within the legal clinics is then translated into uh, into research um, and that is kind of the special place of the legal clinics as opposed to uh, organizations that do uh, legal work, uh, NGOs, uh, human rights organizations, etc. So naturally there are, there, they, there are activities that we were unable to continue and I'll just give one example. We have a human rights clinic uh, that has an amazing project in Greece um, giving legal aid and legal translation to uh, uh, to refugees, uh, mostly Syrian, but also other uh, places in the, in the Middle East uh, that arrive at Europe. And this project is really interesting because the, the unique role that we play in it is that because the University of Haifa is such a diverse university, we have a very large share of Arab speaking students, uh, then our students, as opposed to students from legal clinics in Europe, can give uh, legal translation to these, uh, uh, to these refugees when they arrive in, in uh, Europe. Uh, so we've had uh, four trips to Greece in the past two years. Luckily, we had uh, the last trip uh, uh, just before uh, the outbreak in February. Um, but naturally, uh, the continuation of this project is uh, currently, you know, uh, just on hold, and we hope that we will be able to, to travel again uh, to Greece to continue this, uh, uh, this project. We do give a lot of uh, uh, legal aid. We have a project giving uh, uh, legal aid to, uh, to refugees and to uh, undocumented individuals in Israel, but this project is really a, a unique, uh, I think, um, and very kind of emotional and and humanist experience for our students uh, in Europe. So that's great, Tommy. That's exactly what uh, I was hoping we'd be able to share. So let's turn to some of the work that the, the clinics have been doing uh, for the last eight weeks, uh, how it's changed, what the successes are, what the challenges and the obstacles have been. I'm going to start with you, Dalit, if you don't mind, because one of the things that's been rather controversial and very much in the news uh, has been uh, the uh, use of technology um, in order to track individuals uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, to be able to determine patterns of vulnerability. Uh, but there are also concerns with privacy. That's something we're facing in the United States as well. Israel was far ahead of us in that term. Um, have you been dealing with that issue? And what have been some of the, the questions and issues that uh, uh, you've responded to? 
Um, in Israel, there are two kinds of surveillance. Uh, the first is the police uh, surveillance after the people in home quarantine. The police are getting an automatic call out of uh, all the people quarantine, uh, home quarantine, uh, 300 people uh, from Celera companies every day, and they are checking their locations according to the quarantine location that they declared in the form that they were sent, uh, uh, they filled up when they were sent uh, to quarantine. At the beginning, there was a lot of confusion due to the fact that the police did not have the full list of home quarantine people, and they were counting on the self-reporting system that people use to inform the Ministry of Health about, uh, about them being in home quarantine. The people who got even the messages from the Israeli uh, security agency, the Shin Bet message that uh, they were told to go into a quarantine, they did not understand that they have to self-report uh, about it as well. Uh, this mistake was corrected afterwards, but it turned out that just about 4% disobeyed the quarantine and most of them without malicious attention. So the police got their legal permission in temporary emergency regulations. When the police had to uh, return and ask for an extension of the regulations, this time in a short le uh, legislative uh, process, the clinic with other civilian society NGOs, of course, was participating in the, com in the Knesset Foreign Affairs Defense Committee uh, hearing and suggested to stop the procedure since the, number, uh, the numbers of uh, new, newly infected were dropping down and because the civilians means uh, could have been replaced in our opinion by a more balanced way in, uh, in many ways. For example, if uh, the pool of just 300 people could have been selected randomly from the list itself and checked manually for the locations uh, by calling them to the landline or in any other way and making sure that they are at, uh, at the place that they uh, just uh, said they will be. If, uh, and if they are not there, uh, the police could have sent somebody to check the location. They didn't need to pull all the, um, all the uh, privacy um, de all the private details from the cellar companies. Uh, at the end, the committee uh, heard all the NGOs and the civil society and of course our uh, clinic also, and they decided to not to approve the continuation of this surveillance. So they stopped the, this um, surveillance. The second surveillance in our uh, country is the Israeli security agency, uh, the Shin Bet surveillance. And this surveillance uh, was in purpose of the epidemiologic uh, investigations in order to find out who got in touch with uh, pe people or person who was diagnosed with COVID-19. This time it was an extension of powers that they have already had in a unique uh, regulation of the Shin Bet. So, uh, and also we should bear in mind that we had the Hamagen, maybe you heard about it, the Hamagen application that was designed with uh, privacy concerns already and was um, a less offensive uh, means uh, in order to follow this uh, line of uh, disease. Um, I will not get into the differences between the technology of the Shin Bet surveillance and the Ham again. However, uh, we claim that the committee again, that there are less harmful ways to follow the route of COVID-19 without invade privacy too much. Uh, the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, again, was willing to hear the civilian committee, uh, the uh, community, sorry, and to learn about other ways to achieve the same goal. This time, we decided to approach also professors from the computer science department and to ask them if they have an, an idea for another way to follow the population without invading privacy too much. We suggested some of the ways that uh, the um, that the computer science uh, professor uh, told us to the committee, and of course uh, we did it with other NGOs uh, of the civilian society. Again, the committee decided to extend the duration of powers, but uh, it accepted all, almost all of our uh, recommendations about a limited period of times and about more checks and balances. 
and actually they accepted most of the recommendation of the civilian society and we were very pleased that they uh, were willing to hear us and that we could have influenced in some way. That's great. I, I think those are wonderful outcomes and a lesson that uh, we're going to have to learn ourselves in, in this country coming up. Uh, it's, a, it's a model for us. Uh, let me just remind everyone, by the way, that uh, you do have the uh, Q&A function uh, that's available. So that if you have any questions that you want to ask any of our panelists, I, I do want to encourage you. We're going to save a little bit of time at the end uh, so that uh, if you'd like to be able to uh, raise any uh, issues with, with uh, this incredible group of, of educators and lawyers, uh, that you should take advantage of it. Right. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned through my own practice is that when times go bad, everyone suffers, but poor people suffer worse. Uh, it, it tends to be that uh, in the middle of a crisis, it magnifies the disparities in our community. And your clinic deals very much uh, with protecting the, the rights of, of people who are otherwise disenfranchised, ensuring their protection, both with regards to the government and as well as with private individuals. So can you talk a little bit about how you've stepped it up in, in, with your students in order to uh, be able to deal with these discrepancies in our society to ensure uh, that, that people are being treated fairly? Uh, yeah, so um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about our clinic. Um, so we, uh, we try to promote uh, human rights through uh, litigation, uh, especially through uh, civil uh, procedure. Um, we represent clients in uh, debt cases, uh, housing, um, in tort cases against, uh, for example, uh, state authorities uh, like the police uh, or uh, strong uh, repeat players uh, like banks and the like. Um, just recently, for example, uh, we settled in a lawsuit. Uh, we filed against the police uh, where we uh, represented a, a minor after she was uh, unlawfully uh, uh, got arrested. Um, uh, this was actually the, uh, we settled during uh, during uh, the COVID nineteen, so um, it was uh, it was a nice outcome. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we mostly uh, represent uh, clients uh, that come from underprivileged communities in Israel. Um, so we have, of course, people in poverty, uh, uh, trans uh, transgenders, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, also, uh, you know, former USSR Jews uh, that came uh, to Israel uh, mainly during uh, the 90s, uh, Mizrahi Jews, Ethiopian Jews. Um, so all those uh, unique uh, communities in Israel. Um, and um, we, uh, during, this, uh, uh, during this outbreak, uh, we mainly had to deal with, um, uh, simply put it, uh, access to cash or money. Um, so in Israel, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, the National uh, Insurance uh, Institute um, and many people who receive pensions from uh, this uh, institute, um, pensions like uh, income support, um, uh, disability, child support, elderly uh, pension, uh, most of those people don't uh, have a credit card or debit card or access uh, to the bank uh, cellular application. Um, in normal days. So um, uh, usually in order to get cash, um, um, I mean, mostly they depend on cash in order to, to buy food or, you know, to pay the bills. So in normal days, they just usually physically go to their uh, bank, um, you know, talk with their cashier and, and, uh, and get the money. Um, but in the beginning of, uh, of the outbreak, uh, most of the banks had to close their branches because uh, the regulator in Israel, which is the Bank of Israel, um, ordered them to do so due to the social uh, distancing uh, regulation. Um, you know, people uh, had only one branch open in each district. Uh, I know Israel is small, but still uh, you, you can talk about uh, 30, 40 kilometers, I'm sorry, I don't know the, uh, the measurement in uh, miles, um, uh, but, um, uh, pe and people who live in poverty usually, you know, they don't have cars, so they couldn't drive to this open branch and public transportation also uh, sh was shut down. Um, and, 
we, uh, our, my clinic, together with the Association for uh, Civil Rights in Israel, ACRI, uh, rewrote the Bank of Israel and uh, demanded a solution. Um, in Israel, these pensions have constitutional protection because they provide a, a means to live in dignity, which is, uh, in Israel, a, is a basic right to some extent, uh, one would say. Uh, but uh, after our uh, request to the Bank of Israel, uh, the regulator instructed all the banks to automatically send uh, through the post office uh, the mail uh, debit cards to all their clients who receive pensions. Um, this was uh, meant to be automatically. Uh, they don't need to demand the, the, the card in order to receive it. Um, so, um, you know, at first we thought uh, it was success, but then uh, we realized uh, we have two main problems uh, with this solution. So, first of all, um, the payday date was very close, um, and we figured that the debit cards wouldn't make it till then. Um, and, you know, you have to understand that these people wait all month to payday because the amounts of the pensions are extremely small. Um, and, and usually the money runs out uh, a week or more before the next payday. And they, so, so they have uh, several days that they can't afford to buy food. I personally uh, help a client uh, that literally didn't have money to buy food uh, for her children in, in one of the weekends uh, uh, back then. And, and the second problem was, was that because the uh, these pensions are very uh, low, the amounts are very small, um, a lot of these people are in debt because they don't have a lot uh, of money <laughs> to, uh, to buy basic needs. And uh, uh, many of them, their bank accounts uh, are confiscated. Uh, the pensions are protected by the law uh, and they cannot be seized, but some banks don't give uh, confiscated accounts access to ATM services. Um, so even if the card will get there on time, uh, we figure that some people uh, will not be able to use it. So, you know, the, the thing is that uh, the bank and the regulator, uh, you know, could not fully see the consequences of their policies. We, we really had to educate them about what it means to be in poverty or uh, how it is to how it, a person can survive with a small amount of uh, of cash or money. Um, so in the end, uh, you know, our education uh, didn't really work, and we had to uh, petition the High Court of Justice. Um, uh, after we uh, pulled an all all nighter, uh, so to speak, uh, we filed this uh, urgent uh, petition. And um, we requested the, the, the High Court of Justice to order the banks to open their branches on, uh, on payday, but only for people who receive pensions because we really didn't want to, um, you know, we want to keep the social distancing uh, regulations. Um, so just a couple of days after we, uh, we filed this petition, uh, the commissioners of the bank notified the court that all banks will open on payday uh, to enable people to get access to cash. Um, and, uh, you know, the court obviously ruled that the case was solved, uh, but, but still uh, uh, they did state it in their uh, ruling that it is expected that the banks uh, provide a solution in further similar cases. So uh, from that standpoint, I think it was a, it was a success. And uh, if we have time, uh, maybe later I can uh, talk about uh, another case. I don't want to take a, uh, uh, more time uh, for my friend. You know, uh, it, it, it's astonishing to me. We're, we're sitting here 6,000 miles apart, and what you just described is exactly the same thing I'm doing at the National Consumer Law Center. It's the exact same issues uh, in our society. One very quick follow-up question on it. One of the real challenges, as you're talking about people living in poverty, is how do you communicate? Uh, not everyone has access to high-speed internet like everyone on this phone call or this uh, conference. Uh, how have you been able to communicate with your clients uh, in this time of where you really need to be in touch on a regular basis? You know, so um, we had to just learn each day how to, to better our tools. Um, 
So, um, you know, um, most of our clients, because we move to phones or, you know, mails or apps, uh, most of our clients uh, don't have tech skills or access to technology, you know, even for something that is uh, considered simple, like sending a power of attorney via WhatsApp. Um, you know, they couldn't do it. Uh, and even I had to be, um, you know, I don't want to call it creative, but I just figure out that instead of uh, printing or or something else that just can take a white page and write with their hand a power of attorney. And, you know, I, we live in an area that, you know, those simple solutions don't even uh, come in mind. But when a client told me, I don't know how to use uh, my, my camera and he had to find a neighbor uh, in order uh, to get assistance. Uh, but I must tell you that our students uh, won't be just great lawyers um, in the end of it, but, but also great uh, tech supporters, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, because the amount of resources and, and patience they invested in explaining uh, every client how to send a file or to register to a governmental website, um, you know, were uh, enormous resources. And, um, and I think that, uh, this was also a great lesson for them about social barriers, you know, in 2020 um, and the lack of accessibility because also, um, in normal days, uh, banks are closing and move, moving to uh, technology and, and the people who suffer from this are, uh, you know, the underprivileged. Sounds pretty creative to me, actually. Uh, but uh, Tammy, just uh, you have, as I said, all these other clinics. Maybe you share with us uh, a success story from uh, one of your other clinics dealing with the COVID e epidemic. Yeah, and I just want to, I can, I can uh, uh, you know, I have the privilege of, of boasting because it's not me, it's my clinicians. Uh, but just, uh, I think that one of the most uh, really amazing things about, you know, what has happened in the past two months is that uh, the clinics, you know, were just eight people in, in the end of the day um, have managed to file three petitions to the High Court of Justice, which is, uh, for those of you less familiar with the Israeli uh, uh, system of the courts, is the, is the Supreme Court, is the, high, is the highest court in Israel, um, which is pretty amazing. I think that some lawyers, you know, in their whole career uh, can file uh, sometimes just one. Uh, so we've had three of these um, in really, really important uh, cases. And uh, Dalit was saying about, about the committee in the Knesset, um, Dalit has actually spent, these have been marathonic uh, um, uh, hearings in the committee uh, with all the kids and everything, but still, uh, and, and to have have decision makers really, uh, you know, take into consideration the expertise. So I think this, these have been uh, very uh, challenging, but also very uh, um, uh, good days for, for legal clinics uh, work. So I, I will take uh, the, uh, you know, the, the few minutes that I have to, to say a bit about the clinics that aren't represented here. Um, uh, so, as I said, we have eight clinics, each of them in, in different areas uh, of work. Um, and I'll just say something about two of them. And, you know, I love all my clinics equally, but uh, we don't have enough time for everything. So uh, I'll tell you about the, the another petition that we filed to the High uh, Court of Justice. So as we was starting to say, uh, you know, sometimes people think that in 2020, the, uh, uh, the technological gap, you know, has, has been uh, erased, right? right? Everyone has uh, cellular phones and everybody knows how to uh, use the internet. And especially when uh, you think about children or youngsters, then you think that this has been, uh, uh, that, that that is not a problem anymore. But the move to online learning has really shown that uh, there is still a, a, a very significant uh, gap and very significant inequality in educational resources um, and uh, we have a clinic that does uh, uh, specifically education law um, and is focused all year around in educational justice and equality. Um, and our clients and our connections in the community has shown us that there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, a problem in access to online learning. Um, for example, so just a few numbers, 24% um, 24%, meaning a quarter of the household with, with children in Israel are not connected to the internet. 
and 15.7% uh, of households with children do not own even a single computer. Uh, most families in Israel have more than one child. Um, and so uh, even, you know, so 15.7% so don't have even one computer, but even those who do have uh, a much larger share of families don't have enough computers for all children to be able to access online learning. Um, these numbers are much uh, worse in the Arab population in which 50%, uh, over 50% of the children do not have adequate access to online and computers. Um, and of course, uh, communities such as asylum seekers, uh, uh, families in poverty, uh, Ethiopian origin uh, uh, families, uh, and others have uh, great problems in accessing online learning. So the clinic filed a petition on behalf of different organizations and activists from these uh, communities uh, to uh, uh, order, to, so the court would order the uh, Ministry of Education to ensure access to online learning, including and suggested different uh, solutions, uh, all of which we learned from other places in the world. So, for example, if uh, there are places, there are uh, settlements, uh, especially in the Bedouin community in the south, uh, that do not have access to internet, there are possibilities to bring, for example, a bus giving uh, Wi-Fi to, uh, uh, to the houses surrounding uh, where the bus will stop and giving uh, access to, uh, to the internet and uh, distributing computers and other uh, devices such as, uh, you know, laptops or, or uh, um, um, iPads and, and other devices that will enable children to, uh, to participate properly in, uh, in online learning. Uh, so this was filed about uh, 10 days ago. The, uh, the hearing will be held uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, so we're all kind of waiting for that and hoping that uh, even if there will won't be, uh, at least uh, it will kind of press the Ministry of Education in the right direction. Uh, so that's one thing that we, that we are kind of waiting to see uh, where this takes us. Um, another clinic that we have is the Arab-Palestinian Minority uh, Clinic. So one of the um, communities in Israel that are most um, underprivileged and discriminated against, unfortunately, uh, is the Arab minority. And the University of Haifa uh, boasts a very diverse student body and also in the staff. Um, and, uh, and we also boast uh, the only clinic in Israel in all the law faculties that is directed uniquely to the Arab Palestinian minority. And we have different cases uh, uh, concerning their uh, rights and discrimination. Um, so it turns out that there, there is an, a governmental agency uh, that is in charge of advertising. So in a, an era like this outbreak, uh, governmental advertising is very critical to tell people, you know, how they should behave, uh, how to protect themselves against, <clears throat> sorry, against the virus. Uh, Etc. Uh, the governmental adver advertising agency uh, spends a, a very small amount of its uh, of its resources on advertising in Arabic and advertising in Arab Arab media, right? In the outlets that the Arab population uh, uses. Uh, so the clinic, together with uh, several other organizations, uh, approached the uh, advertising the governmental advertising agency, requir requiring them uh, to. Um, allocate enough resources and to make sure that all the campaigns uh, in the different uh, and the different topics, right? So this isn't only about, you know, how to behave, but also there is now the Ramadan uh, uh, festivities. Uh, so to make sure that there is enough advertising and educating the citizens on how to uh, protect themselves and protect others uh, in this very, uh, um, you know, quickly changing uh, circumstances. So that is another uh, project uh, that we've been uh, doing. That's great, Tony. What I'd like to do right now uh, is, is move shift to a sort of like a quick fire, uh, ask uh, Reut and, and Dali uh, two questions and, and get a quick response uh, back on it. Hope that people take the opportunity now also to uh, get any last minute questions that you may want me to pose as well uh, to the panelists. But for Reut and Dali, if you could identify um, a project that you were working on before the pandemic struck and, and what effect it's had uh, on the initiative that you were working on, uh, and also, uh, if your experience over the last eight to 10 weeks 
has identified uh, for the event horizon going forward, is there a new issue, a new focus that you had not had before that you anticipate that as, as we, God willingly, come out of this crisis someday soon, uh, you will be able to, uh, to direct your attention to going forward? Uh, Ray, do you want to uh, start out on that and I'll ask Dalit afterwards? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, we had to put aside uh, our trans folks and uh, access to healthcare projects. Um, actually, uh, we have in Israel a committee that deals with um, uh, approval of gender confirmation services, and uh, the committee stopped working uh, during uh, this crisis. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, trans people, you know, can get. Um, uh, uh, access to uh, uh, specific surgeries or uh, uh, change their uh, identification um, uh, papers uh, in order to, you know, uh, be identified as their uh, gender. We um, we had a big uh, case. We uh, filed the uh, amicus uh, curia there about um, you know basic rights of trans uh, people in the healthcare system. Uh, so that had to put aside, but now now we're trying to get uh, to get back to these uh, issues. Um, and as far as your second uh, question, uh, you know, sadly, uh, I, we anticipate that in the coming months uh, we will see a lot of new clients uh, that maybe didn't need our clinic before and now uh, have to face have to face with uh, you know debt and, and unemployment and housing problems. Uh, so I, I guess we will continue with a lot of the work we already are doing, but maybe the workload will just increase. That's great. Talit? Um, yes, we, um, we are working on legal opinions mainly and policy papers uh, concerning market failures in entrepreneurship fields, including angel investments and technology incubators. However, Due to the COVID-19 time, uh, it was less important and, the, and we are willing to go back into business uh, when we can about these uh, situations as well. And for the second question, uh, in my opinion, we have to deal with policy papers and legal opinions about transparency as well, not just privacy, but transparency, because without transparency, we cannot be sure what is going on and what is the right way to solve the problems that the country is facing. Uh, if civilian society will get enough information, we can offer uh, help uh, for the authorities and maybe we can reach the most desirable result concerning privacy issues and saving lives and other issues as well. That's great. Tammy, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, sure. I'll actually talk about another clinic that I didn't have a chance to say anything about. We have a dispute resolution clinic, which is also a very unique clinic in Israel, uh, in which our students, even before the semester begins, they uh, pass a mediation course and they become certified mediators. Um, and we use uh, mediation as a tool. First of all, we give pro bono mediation, so we give access to justice to uh, uh, um, uh, disadvantaged individuals, but we also use uh, mediation, the language of mediation, as a tool for a social change. So, uh, because of the because of the outbreak, because of uh, uh, the lockdown, uh, we we couldn't have any uh, mediations going on here. But we moved uh, to online mediation. And one of the interesting things that the clinic was able to do, in addition to just you know giving our services online, is to create. Um, uh, um, document or a kind of best practices uh, guideline document for mediators in Israel to give a service to the community of mediators uh, about online mediation, which is practice that in Israel is really, really only beginning, but in other places in the world has already had some experience. Uh, so our students were able, you know, alongside the experience uh, to really kind of move forward the field of mediation in Israel by offering best practices. So I think that, that, that maybe kind of, you know, trying to, to be positive about uh, the situation and to, to see it as an opportunity for learning and for uh, kind of developing our skills and our student skills, um, then this is a really nice project in which, you know, alongside our shift to, uh, to a new, uh, to, to kind of the new reality, we're able to uh, to help others in the community 
of mediators in this case uh, uh, to do uh, to do the same to adjust. One of the uh, and just tapping back, and I'll come back to Dalit again on it. If there is an advantage here. I think we're finding that uh, the old norms of how we practice law. Um, I've been practicing for 41 years. This is all new to me, but I'm finding that there's all sorts of new opportunities uh, to be able to use technology to expand uh, our reach and to be able to have access. And since I'm an immigrant to the technological world, but uh, but your students are, are natives to it, uh, Dalit, uh, Ray, uh, how are you using technology uh, and how might you be using technology in the future uh, to enhance your ability not only to teach your students, but also to deliver services to your clients? Uh, first of all, I think that we don't have to just get to meet each other in person every time that we want just to talk for 10 minutes so we can use technology to just avoid the roads and uh, maybe to meet uh, with, uh, with everybody online. I'm doing it with my students. Some of them, uh, they are not living in Haifa and uh, have difficulties to come to the university. So I don't think that I have to call them every time that I just want to talk to them for 10 minutes. And I can think that we can use technology for now on to communicate uh, for short terms, uh, uh, long distance, uh, in, in a long distance way. And we can take also uh, the technology, as Tammy said, and use it as online dis dispute resolutions. Uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to be at the same room in order to uh, dispute a resolution. And, and uh, I think that we can use technology in a good way. We have just to keep in mind that also Zoom technology is um, a very tricky one. Uh, if you don't have a password, you can just uh, go into other Zoom's uh, meetings and you have to keep in mind also um, um, concerning about security issues and things like that. But uh, we can use technology to improve our, our lives and uh, to keep all the uh, communication uh, when we can, uh, maybe online, but uh, there is no other way just to meet uh, in person with the students and to get uh, the feeling of what they, they have to say. You have to meet them in person, of course, but uh, sometimes you can just do it online. That's great. Are you? Yeah, I think about our clients um, who don't have a lot of time and money and so, um, you know, we need, I don't know how it is in uh, the US, but in Israel, um, in order to sign an affidavit, um, you need to meet the person in person. And uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, the Bar Association um, uh, rules that uh, during this time, you can uh, confirm uh, an affidavit via a video um, uh, uh, you know, Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, and, and I think about our clients that, you know, in order to uh, file a, a petition or a lawsuit, they had to come. Sometimes we represent people who are living uh, far from, uh, for, from our uh, offices. And uh, it can uh, simplify things uh, for them, but also for us as lawyers, you know, also, you know, till this day you have to... Um, when you file a petition, you must send it with a, me with a, with a person, with a messenger to bring it to, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the state attorney. And uh, because of um, uh, the outbreak, um, the, uh, I don't know if it was the, the bar association of the, or the court um, uh, regulator, uh, the, uh, the Minister of uh, Justice, maybe, I, I, I don't quite remember, but uh, um, the, uh, there was a new regulation that you can send via uh, email. So, uh, and this also lowered the costs for our clients because, uh, you know, to send it with uh, a person who can uh, provide proof that um, uh, the lawsuit arrived to, to its place it also costs money. So I, I think uh, in those points, we can see how we can use it uh, to our advantage also for our clients and our practice. You know, that, that I think is a great place for us to sort of sum up here. Um, the, uh, uh, I, um, I love the clinics. I love the clinics at the University of Haifa Law School. They do more with less than virtually any organization that I know. Um, and at one point there, 
they're raising the next generation of lawyers with both a social consciousness and, and a dedication to providing access to justice. On the other hand, they're delivering services, as you, as you were just saying, Ryu, to people who otherwise just would not have representation. No one else would ever speak for them other than the work that you and your students are, are doing. Um, in the interest of time, um, I would suggest to folks, if you would like to be able to address questions directly to any of our panelists, uh, to please just email it to uh, info at asuh.org, uh, and we will pass that information along to the panelists, and they'll get, be able to get uh, back to you. I'm going to give the next to last word to Karen Berman, who's going to come back in a second uh, to talk to everyone. But I wanted to uh, just thank again uh, all three of our panelists. Tommy, you have every right to be very proud of each and every one of your, your, your clinics. And I'm proud to be affiliated uh, with, with all of them. I'm also very pleased to be able to call you uh, not only colleagues, but friends. So thank you very much. I wish you the best of health. Be safe. Continue to do the great work that you're doing. Karen, I leave it to you. Thank you, Stuart, and um, I echo your thanks to Tammy and Rayut and Dalit. Um, you know, the work the clinics do is is just so critical, and, and we're just so very proud to have them as part of University of Haifa. Um, and you know, with so much attention um, right now on on COVID and the disease itself, which obviously is is there for a reason, um, it, it is easy for everybody to forget that all the um, the societal problems not only still exist, but actually are becoming exacerbated and it makes the work that you're doing um, all that much more critical and, and navigating these um, uncertain times under these incredible conditions uh, is difficult for all of us. And the fact that, you know, you and your team are all so dedicated to doing it um, is really helping us build, um, you know, the future for Israel and really for the world that we're all looking for. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate all of you uh, joining us here today. Uh, as Stuart said, if you have more um, questions, please send them to us. We're happy to uh, we're happy to forward them on or put you in touch with any of our experts. Um, I also would be remiss in not mentioning uh, we would also welcome your support for the clinics as well. Um, you can find out ways to support them on our website asuh.org/backslash/donate. Um, you know. The work is very important and is certainly more important now, I think, than ever. Thank you again for joining us. We'll have a recording of uh, today's session available on our website tomorrow. We'll send it out via email as well, um, put it up on Facebook, and we hope to see you soon. Wishing you all uh, much good health uh, in these uncertain times. Thank you.